Welcome to my sewing room. I am so excited about this show for you today. This absolutely wonderful alphabet applique quilt that has all the cute A's and B's and C's and D's and even down to a zebra and a turtle that you've been enjoying the whole uh, series. We're gonna show you how to put this together today and it's so easy. Another quick and easy project, our little craft today, is this adorable little teddy bear pin cushion. Even has on a little hat and has a little, uh, as my daughter called it, a little purse on its hand. Another wonderful project for you today will be this traveling cummerbund with silk ribbon. And it looks like just a really good looking cummerbund which with this wonderful blue ribbon, it'd be really cute with jeans or anything else you are wearing for travel, but it has a secret. When I turn it over, you can see there is a little zippered compartment. So you can put your traveler's checks, your passport, or your just some money so uh, to be safe as you travel. Now then, we have a beautiful antique technique for you, and it will be found on this wonderful little child's dress. You know, one of the most beautiful things about this dress is not the technique we're going to show you, but that's a real interesting one. But look at the beautiful embroidery that comes down the front. And if you are so fortunate as to have to one of today's wonderful embroidery machines, all you do is just simply touch a button, and you too can get something wonderful like that. The technique we're going to share with you is the one here on this very corner crossed pin tucks very easily made today since we have double needles to make our pin tucks it would have been a little bit harder to have made that around the turn of the century when this dress was made now won't you come over to the technique boards with me and let's see just how easy it is to put together this fabulous quilt Putting this quilt together is really very easy. I'll take you through it step by step. Step number one, the re one square, in other words, there's a little alphabet on each quilt. One square is put together to one piece of stripping. All right, then those pieces are put together in one long strip, another long strip, and there are four total. Now the next step, take one of these strips and you'll cut a piece of red sashing that's the length of the whole piece and attach this to the whole strip. Go ahead and do the same thing for all four sections and basically your quilt is nearly finished. The next step is to get another piece of sashing to go all the way along this side and all the way along this side. Then got two more pieces of sashing to go, one over here, and one over here. Then, after that is all done, we're gonna to have to measure and add the red sashing to the top and add the red sashing to the bottom. Now, there's still another piece at the top and another piece at the bottom that has to be made. The little apple over here and the little flower over here on the quilt, we have to make a piece to go all the way across the top of the quilt, and then we have to make a piece to go all the way across the bottom of the quilt. Now, this figure, number eight, shows you how the whole thing has been sashed and put together. And then over here, we've got a place to show you where the binding will be. It will be all the way around the four sides of the quilt. Now then, let's go over to the sewing machine where I've asked Louise Baird to actually show you the methods that she used to quilt the insides of those squares and to put the sashing on this beautiful quilt that Louise made. Louise, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Uh, first of all, after you've put all of your top together and make sure you press your seams, you want to make your quilt sandwich. And the quilt sandwich consists of your top and your back with your batting in between. Now you do need to baste it together. I did use one of the little quilt basting guns uh, to baste my quilt together, but you can use uh, safety pins or a thread and needle, whatever it is that you want to use. Then on the quilt, it was just stitched in the ditch, which means it was stitched right on the line between the uh, white center and the red sashing. Usually I use a um, an invisible thread like this, something that's really soft so that it doesn't show. And in the needle, I usually would use, I'm sorry, I use the invisible thread in the needle and a uh, matching thread for the bobbin. And to stitch in the ditch, just a regular straight stitch length. You can use a straight stitch foot or a um, 
quarter inch foot, whatever it is that you want, and just stitch in the ditch. And remember that the ditch is right in between. Now these are two little pieces of rubber shelf lining that you can use, again, it, to spread it apart a little bit so that once you have stitched in the ditch and you relax it, it will just close up so that it doesn't even show. And here I've got an, uh, a pink thread and you still can't even see how okay. see it because it, even though it is contrasting thread. Okay, now to put the sashing on, when you create the sashing, you want the sashing total to be six times your finished width. Okay, so if my sashing was three quarters of an inch, then um, my, the way I cut it, th six times that width. Six times that wide, okay. Okay, and then fold it in half, and then now I've started this, I've already pinned it down, and I'm going to straight stitch on the three quarter inch line, and just straight stitch. When you get three quarters of an inch from the edge, which is right here. I'm going to take one more stitch here and I'm going to pivot and stitch at an angle all the way to the end. Okay, now I'm going to lift up, cut my thread, and if you fold back and then this way, you can see how it meets right at the three quarter inch line. I'm going to push this out of the way. And now I'm going to start stitching right at that spot again. Louise, do you actually draw those lines on there when you're turning um, that corner? Sometimes it's actually easier to draw the lines mm -hmm. because um, it, it wants to shift sometimes. And now, I didn't do this too good, really, but because I missed my lines. Well, that's okay. It, you can you would, fix it? Yes, I can easily fix it by restitching it, but you end up with a mitered corner. Okay. Okay. To finish at the end, at the bottom of the quilt, when you very f first start stitching your quilt uh, binding on, leave several inches that's not stitched. And then you'll go all the way around the quilt and Again, you've left several, about eight or nine inches unstitched. Fold it so that it's at an angle and the angles meet right here, okay? Then you will take that angled corner, angled binding rather, and open it out. You draw a line. That's where it's been creased okay. when you originally stitched it. Stitch on the line with just a straight stitch, always take your pins out. Okay, and when you do that, it will meet up or match up right exactly. And this one I've got already, it's been stitched and pressed. You wanna be sure before you trim off these mm -hmm. ends that it's going to be the right width right here. So now all I need to do is trim this to a quarter of an inch and have it folded and then finish stitching. And that's all there is. It'll be nice and even. When you turn it over, it won't even look like any like a real specific join. It'll almost be like the rest of the quilt is. Well, Louise, that's absolutely fascinating. Let me ask you something. Do you mm -hmm. think this is one of the easier kinds of quilts to make, what we call a sampler quilt? Um, I enjoy the, the sampler quilts more than any because it's uh, a lot of different things on it uh -huh. and not just uh -huh. one thing. And Louise, I think too that in, in our industry, especially in the heirloom sewing industry, we just love applique too. Right. And this is such a wonderful way to have a permanent treasure for the family to have this wonderful little applique alphabet quilt. And next we have a wonderful craft for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today my daughter, Joanna Pullen Hammett. Joanna is a recent graduate of Texas Christian University and she has joined me in my business. Joanna, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. Today I'm going to show you how to make this darling bear pin cushion. First, you take the three top pieces, the three, and you 
sew them together. You also have to be sure to sew the lining as well. So your end product for your front pieces will look like this. And then of course the lining will look like this. Next, you'll sew the back pieces. There's only two of them. And don't forget the lining. So your back two pieces will look like this. And then your lining will look like this. Next, you have to sew your front pieces and your back pieces together and you have to stuff them. These are already pre-stuffed, so I'll show you what the stuffing looks like. Once they are stuffed, you sew the shoulders, under the arms, and the bottom to make your bare body. Next, you need to make the bear's collar. So what you do is you get your flowers, your leaf, and you sew the front and the back, and then you top stitch all around your leaf, and it will end up looking like this. You will need five leaves. Finally, you have the bear's bow, and also the bear's purse's bow. You will sew the pieces together, top stitch, scrunch it up like this, and it'll go right on top of the bear as you see here and on the purse as well. Finally, just as easy as that, you have a darling bear cushion. You know what, now did you buy the, is that a you purchase buy, bear? Right, okay. you buy the bear at any craft store. That is so Isn't cute. Isn't he darling? Yeah, he is. And you know, Joanna, if you really wanted to do, that little purse is just a little purse, a little it's strawberry, a little, mm -hmm. but you could even purchase a little emery, you know, those strawberry emeries that right. make the, you put your pins in to sharpen and the sharpen pins, them. and then you would have a little emery on your bear pin cushion too. That is absolutely adorable and so much fun for a gift. Oh, it is. Easy to make. Easy to make. Fun to give. And it's even in red and green, so that could be a holiday gift. Joanna, thank you so much thank for you. joining me on the show today. Next, I have a really fascinating antique technique for you. I think you're going to love this little antique dress. It's just so pretty, the way it has the uh, entredeau around the neckline and the gathered lace and this really, really magnificent embroidery down the middle. And see those mitered corners on the lace? Now, you know, we're going to talk about tucks here in a few minutes, and I wanted you to see how the sleeves have those wonderful tucks on them. Isn't that neat the way they've even tucked the lace on the sleeves? Now, if you'll come on down to the skirt, the really special technique, which we're going to do right here in a minute, is going to be these cross tucks. Now, these are folded tucks, folded cross tucks, which I'm going to share with you how to do those. Of course, the easiest way is not to fold them at all, but to do double needle pin tucks. Okay, let's see how this happens. First of all, I'm going to show you the folded tucks first. First of all, I'm going to draw the lines here wherever I'm going to make the folded tucks. I'm going to draw the lines across and up and down. Then I'm going to fold the tucks in and make a straight stitch. Now those are a little harder to do, but it's okay. I mean, it's not really that hard to do, especially on fold lines, because the double needle pin tucks I'm going to show you in a minute are a lot easier to do. Now then here, after you've made the three folded tucks this way, then we're going to go on the fold lines and we're going to fold and make the tucks this way. Let me just kind of fold this back to show you. You see, I would simply fold the tucks and using the presser foot, I would guide and stitch. Now, the easy way to do it is the one I'm going to share with you right now. Once again, you draw the lines across and up and down. That is to know exactly where you're going to place the double needle pin tucks. Then I have done double needle pin tucks, one, two, three. And over here you can see I have drawn, I have not drawn, I have stitched three more sets of double needle pin tucks. One, two, three. And that would certainly be the easiest way. Now let's do those double needle pin tucks, the kind that I think are much easier to do. And I believe you might also. Now then I'm using the double needles and I have a pin tuck foot here, which is going to make a beautiful double needle pin tuck. However, if your machine does not have a pin tuck foot, and, and you can use double needles and just use a regular zigzag foot. But this is going to make a perfectly beautiful double needle pin tucks. Now, watch carefully. I'm getting ready to go down here in this area, cross over the ones I've just made. I'm going to slow down just a little bit 
I'm going to slow down just a little bit, cross over those pin tucks that I have just made, come on down just a little bit more, and now then I'm home free, I'm already down here on the bottom, and that really is the easy way of doing the double needle pin tucks that cross, or rather the cross tucks. Next, I have a really beautiful silk ribbon stitch for you. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand. Beverly is the author of a wonderful book on embroidery called Colonial Inspirations. She is also and very frequently a guest designer for both magazines, So Beautiful and Fancy Work. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Today, Martha, I have made this very pretty little belt, which has a secret. <laughs> because inside here we have a zip. It means that if you're traveling or something like that, you can pop some money or your credit cards or something like that in behind and not a soul knows that it's there. So you've, it's just a little security thing for us. Uh, the daisy that we're doing today is particularly suitable for clothing because it's a very tight little daisy and very simple to do, but it doesn't catch easily. So anywhere where you, there could be problems, then this is a very suitable one. Now, it's very, very easy indeed. Do need about 14 inches of silk ribbon. We normally would work with 12, but this takes a tad more. So we're starting here at 12 o'clock. Bring the thread down here to the middle. Go from the middle out to three o'clock back to the middle and down to six o'clock, back to the middle and across to nine o'clock. So effectively you've quartered it. You'll also notice that I left quite a large circle in the middle here because we're then going to put three stitches in each quarter. So you can appreciate that by the time we've got to the finished daisy like this, uh, there's not a lot of room left and you'll just fill that with French knots. So we'll just quickly do that quarter down there to the middle, across to three o'clock, back to the middle, down to six o'clock, back to the middle, and across to nine o'clock. Now the one thing that you really do have to be careful about when you come to do these stitches in between, and I didn't honestly believe that this could happen until I actually saw a student do it. We do not want a diamond shaped daisy. We'd like a round one, please ladies. <laughs> so when you're doing these stitches around here, do please be aware that you need to fan them slightly. Don't just line them up with a long here like this. We don't want them like that. We want the circle like that. So we'll put in those three and we will continue on round until we have the completed daisy like this. And you can see I've just used some embroidery thread to do little tiny French knots in there. Now the project itself is very simple to make. Simply take a piece of fabric and first of all um, pin tuck it in the trellis fashion. Then put a little piece of, uh, we use pellon fleece, a very um, low loft batting would be suitable, and then work the embroidery. Then you put the backing piece on the back like this. And the next step is to now take your piping and put it around here, stitch it on all the way round. The last thing to do to it is, of course, to put these pieces here, and they can be made to fit any length. Now, what I do want you to notice, please, is that this end, it, the, can you see the angle goes like that, and this end, this longest end, is the point that goes at the bottom. You would naturally expect it to go like that, but of course, if we did it like that, we would end up with something like that. So therefore, it has to go this way. Also these have been fused with a heavy duty fusing to give it strength. 
Now that's the front piece. Then here's the back piece you will see. I have put in a zip just to make it and this is when you've stitched it in then open it. Um, you just take your scissors and open along here. We've put our two side pieces on like that. We then put the two pieces together and what I particularly want you to notice here is I have stitched all the way round, right the way round and right the way round there as well. I haven't left an opening in here as you would if you were doing a normal project. But what I did do before I started to do that stitching is I actually opened the zip so that I can then, when I go, I can pull, you can see I've done this and I can just pull it through like this and you end up with a very neat finish and no little seam at the bottom here that you have to sew by hand. That is fascinating. Your little <laughs> turning area was your zipper. All right. I love the way you say zip, Beverly. <laughs> we call them zippers and you call them zips and I know everyone enjoys all the wonderful ways, the wonderful phrases you have. And next I would like to invite you to come along to my attic with me. This beautiful blouse would really be very easy to make, especially if you purchased eyelet fabric and did not make it by hand the way this lovely lady did. Do you see the folded tucks? They come down this way and there's just a little lace folded in for a miter. Here are more tucks that come all the way down the side. And by the way, every one of these tucks were lovingly stitched in by hand. Now you may look like that this is all over eyelet fabric, you know, like the kind you can get at the store today. Well, guess what? It wasn't. This eyelet was stitched in there, every bit of it by hand. I think it's a very beautiful placket down the back, the way the little antique buttons are in the little handmade buttonholes. And you can also get a lot better view of this absolutely magnificent eyelet that this mother stitched in and stitched in and stitched in. I cannot imagine having the patience to make all over eyelet fabric. You know, it ends up being a really small world when you have a television show that goes all over the country and I get the sweetest letters from our viewers. And I got a letter uh, from Emily Sipple of Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And she says, in the dedication to your Martha's Sewing Room Series 200 book, I read that your son, John Houston Crocker, had attended the George School in Newtown, Pennsylvania. I am also a George School graduate. I come from a Quaker family that has lived in Bucks County, Pennsylvania since William Penn. George School was founded in 1893. My grandfather, A. Russell Burton, graduated in 1900. My father, Anthony Burton, graduated in 1931. And I graduated in 1970. My sewing from the heart contribution is that I dress Quaker dolls. We friends have a long tradition of that. My dear friend Faith, who is also a Quaker, is blind since birth. I have a porcelain doll and I want to dress her in silk so Faith can feel her face, the silk bonnet, the silk dress, and the fine linen petticoat. Sincerely yours, Emily Burton Sipple from Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Emily, thank you so much for sharing that you also went to the same school that my son John went to. And John did really love being in uh, Newtown, Pennsylvania. And I might add to you and the other George School people that he is now a missionary in Africa. You know, so many people are sewing for those less fortunate or for those in need or just to share the joy the way that this lady was going to share the joy with her friend who is blind. And you know, it is wonderful to feel silk and to feel linen. I want to thank all of you for joining me in my sewing room today. I've had so much fun, and I certainly hope you have too. May I invite you to come back next time?